Okay, so today we're going to shift focuses a bit um, and move from looking at the dynamical plane to a parameter plane. So up until now we've been thinking about the, comp the complex plane and we look at a point and we ask the question um, about that point under a specific polynomial. We can say, is this point in the Julia set? Is it in the Fatou set? What is its orbit under this? So we kind of are thinking about the plane as being a thing acted on by polynomials. Today we're going to shift focus. Instead of thinking about the plane being acted upon by poly po a specific polynomial, we're going to try to think about it as representing all quadratic polynomials in some sense. So, start. Um, the thing we're the thing we'll be interested in today are quadratic polynomials, and as people might remember, quadratic polynomials look like ax squared plus bx plus d. And so since we're working over the complex numbers, these will be complex numbers. And so we can associate the set of all quadratic polynomials with C3 just by sending a polynomial ax squared plus bx plus d to its coefficients. So just going to the tuple a, b, d. And vice versa, so given a tuple, we just send that tuple to the polynomial with this coefficient. So in some sense, we can think about the space of all quadratic polynomials being parameterized by C3. So every point in the C3, we can think of as not just being a point, but actually thinking about it as being a polynomial. And then this gives us some nice structure to study the set of polynomials. But this is a lot bigger than we want to work with. It's three-dimensional, we can't picture it, and we really only care about polynomials up to conjugation by an automorphism of C. So, so recall if phi from C to C is an automorphism phi to Z is equal to alpha Z plus beta where alpha and beta are complex numbers and alpha is zero. So these are the automorphisms that just affine transfers. So what do you mean for automorphisms? Like homeomorphisms or? So automorphisms being conformal isomorphisms. Okay. So bijective holomorphic maps with bijective inverse, um, or with holomorphic inverse, sorry. Um, yeah, so they're just affine transformations of the plane. And it turns out that if we look at quadratic polynomials up to conjugation by these, we cut off two of our dimensions. So instead of having a C3, we we'll only have a C. In particular, any polynomial ax squared plus bx plus d is conjugate to a unique polynomial of the form x squared plus c. So there's a unique automorphism sending this polynomial to this under conjugation. So by conjugation. So we can reduce studying the set of polynomials polynomials of the form x squared plus c, where c is a complex number. And so just as we did before, we can think about this as being c, parameterized by the one copy of the complex numbers, where we just send the polynomial x squared plus c, we'll map down to c, and give it a c in the complex plane, we send it to the polynomial x squared plus c. Um, so this is what we'll call the parameter plane for this talk. So this C here where we're thinking about each point as being a quadratic polynomial, this form will be the parameter plane. Um, and so our goal will be to study a specific subset of this. Um, in particular, so the, the set we'll be interested in is going to be the set M. C and C, such that 
axis of the orbit of zero under the polynomial P C sub Z, which I'll say in a minute, is bounded. So where P C sub Z, P sub C of Z is just the polynomial Z squared plus C. So this is a point in our parameter space. So this is a set subset of the parameter space, and it's just things that have the forward orbit of zero is bounded. This is called or referred to as the Mandel broth set. Because Mandelbrot, although not discovering it or proving interesting, and be the first to prove interesting things about it, or being the first to picture it, um, popularized it and kind of helped re energize the field, I guess, around this object. So, to see how this is, what this looks like real fast, although I'm sure mostly you have seen it before, this works. So this picture of the, the entire plane is the parameter plane, and then this black region here is the Mandelbrot set. So each point in, in the black region is an element of a set, so that the polynomial corresponding to that point has bounded forward orbit of zero. So for example, this is the parameter plane, but with this program, if I click on a point here, um, If I click on a point there, we get it moves us to the dynamical plane, and this is the Julia set corresponding to whatever initial guess I get gave, which is the number at the top there. And so that's the Julia set for that polynomial. Yes. That we've seen here. And we yeah. we said uh, zero should have bounded orbit, and it turns out here that it certainly will. There, and it looks like zero is mapping into this fixed point, kind of. So its orbit will be bounded. Um, or, for example, if we click in this region here, we'll get something close to the kind of airplane. -y. And again, you can check that zero will have a bounded orbit. Um, would there be any way to tell what that picture should look like from the Mandelbrot set? Um, sort of, and we'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Okay, so um, the first thing to note about the Mandelbrot set is that it is and is compact. Has, is connected. Um, so let's, for sake of time, just prove that it's compact. Its fullness essentially comes down to um, maximal modulus principle, and we'll be in the notes if you want to see all the details. But so to show it's compact, you've got to show it's closed and bounded. So let's start with bounded. What does full mean? Its complement is connected. Okay. Uh, so to show m is bounded. Let's look at the sequence C, take a C in the complex numbers, and consider the sequence C1 equal to C, C2 equals to C1 squared plus C, Cn equals Cn minus 1 squared plus C. Notice this is exactly the orb forward orbit of 0. This is Pc of 0. 
so on. So we're looking at the forward orbit of zero here. We're just kind of writing it in a slightly different way. And um, note that by triangle inequality, reverse or yeah, reverse triangle, you have C n squared. Or I guess let's just do it for the one case or the two case. We have C n C two is equal to the absolute value of C one squared plus C. This is just or it's triangling less than or equal to absolute value of c squared minus c, uh, which is absolute value of c times absolute value of c minus 1, which is c1 times absolute value of c minus 1. And the claim is that if so if c has absolute value greater than 2, strictly greater than 2, this number here will be greater than 1, and so we know this is greater than c1, which means c2 is greater than the absolute value of c1, which means c2 is greater than c1, and so this we're increasing in the first step, and going by induction now you can show essentially with the same process, right, because cn will be cn minus 1 squared plus c, or is triangling, pulling things out, we can show that you'll end up with something in the form cn minus 1 times c minus 1, absolute value of c minus 1 in each step. And as long as the absolute value of c is greater than 2, we'll show that this is actually a strictly increasing sequence. Well, that's strictly increasing. This means it's obviously going to have to be unbounded. Um, and so this will go to infinity, meaning the orbit of z orbit is necessarily bounded. So this will imply bounded, but it also says a bit more. Um, in particular, it tells us that if at any point, it's kind of silly, but if at any point one of these CNs right, becomes bigger than 2, we know it will also diverge because We'll just start our same argument at that point. So we also see that uh, an element c is in the Mandelbrot set if and only if the cn's are less than two for all n. So we can actually write that m is the intersection over all n greater than zero of the set c and c such that the absolute value of cn is less than 2. And this is, sorry, less than or equal to. That's closed now. It's just less than or equal to. And intersection of closed sets is closed. So this implies closed, which implies compact. And so we're done with at least the compactness, and I'll leave full for the notes. Um, note um, the bound of the uh, Mandelbrot set being bounded by 2, which is what we are doing right here, kind of, is actually sharp. There are points that actually hit 2. Um, so we know now that the Mandelbrot set is compact and contained in the disk of radius, closed disk of radius 2, and it's full. But changing direction slightly, there's actually a different way we can think about the Mandelbrot set. Um, in particular, polynomial p, c, and z, which I'll throughout the talk just use to mean z squared plus c as one critical point. Zero. And we know from our talk yesterday, we know that if this critical point, um, let's see, if this critical point stays in the filled Julia set, then our Julia set is connected. But this will stay in the filled Julia set, right? If exactly if the critical point isn't in the basin of infinity, so. So this is so then 
So this implies that uh, K sub PC is connected if and only if zero is in P sub C, right? So if and only if zero is in the full Julia set. But this is if and only if zero is not in the basin of attraction of infinity, which by definition is if and only if the orbit of zero under PC is bounded. So going just through a list of inequalities, a point is in here if and only if it's not in zero is not in the basin of infinity, which is if and only if zero is in the Phil Julia set, which is if and only if it's connected. So we actually get a second definition for the Mandelbrot set. So our first right here was that the C and C such that the orbit of C is the zero is bounded. But it actually turns out that the Mandelbrot set is set is a connected locus. It is M is the set C and C such that J sub PC is connected. Um, again, PC and Z. So it's a connected locus. It's actually a set of C's where these Julia sets are exactly connected. And that's what we saw, right? So um, if Projector turns on. Warms up so we can kind of see what's going on. So we see if I pick a point in the Mandelbrot set, so suppose I pick up here, it certainly looks connected. I mean, Maybe you might say, oh, it's just a picture, it's not connected, but it actually is. You can prove that using the exact sequence we used yesterday. But it looks connected if I pick points in the chain. Or if I pick maybe the point maybe here. No, I got outside of it. Sometimes picking small bulbs is hard. So there's a connected thing. However, uh, if I pick something outside of it, you know, it looks completely disconnected. It's kind of cantry. That's exactly what it would be uh, if it's outside the choice. So, so that definition at least may also makes sense with our, you know, experimental things we see with the computer, which is kind of amazing because I believe this definition or fact was actually noted by the two back 1911-ish, 1910-ish. Well before you know the first ever picture of the Mandelbrot set. Uh, so, even more amazing fact is the Mandelbrot set is a connected locus, so it parameterizes connected Julia sets in some sense, right? But it actually turns out the Mandelbrot set itself is connected. And this is an awesome theorem that somehow shows, you know, it's one of those examples where somehow you parameterizing you're parameterizing objects that have a certain property, and mysteriously, your parameter space also somehow has that property despite it not being entirely clear that it should from its definition. So, theorem, and this is due to Duity and Hubbard in 1980-something, is connected. Um, I won't go through all the details of the proof because it's um, a bit technical, not hard, just a lot of things you have to check. But I'll sketch the main idea. Um, and in some ways in the proof we'll see that this notion that it is the connected locus comes up. So proof idea, well, build a map. Phi, capital 
feed from the plane without the Mandelbrot set to the plane without the closed unit disk. So this is the idea. We want to build such a conformal map, which will instantly tell us that this is connected. Um, and this instantly might remind some of us from our previous talk, well, this seems like Butcher's Theorem, right? Butcher's Theorem somehow gave us that if it's connected or something, we got this map that extended and gave us a nice conformal map. But we're in parameter space. We don't have any of the dynamics that helped us build the Butcher coordinate. We just have a some set. We don't have any dynamical objects moving around to like compose to build this map up. So how do we do it? And the idea is, well, we don't have any dynamics in the Mandelbrot set. But the Mandelbrot set itself parameterizes the dynamical things. So let's just see what we can do. So if we take a C, which is outside the Mandelbrot set, right? Then by definition, um, the Julia set of PC is disconnected, right? Just by definition, it's disconnected. But this means um, the critical point of PC is in the basin of infinity, right? And again, the critical point is just zero. But, so what can we do? So we know we have a disconnected Julia set. We know we have a critical point somewhere in the base of infinity at zero. Um, so, but we can build build what you call it. a super attractive fixed weight infinity, so we can build the butcher coordinate at infinity. Say this map is phi sub c. And we also know how far the butcher coordinate extends. Phi c will extend until it hits the critical point. It won't go past the critical point. The critical point won't be in the domain of definition, but it will go as far as it possibly can so the critical point will be in the boundary of the image. So we have this map, V sub C, which is a map from some subset U to D. Um, sorry, not D, from C to D. It's the critical point. So we want to somehow make this map. The critical point won't be in the domain of definition of the Butcher coordinate, but the critical value will be. So zero is not in the domain of definition. C of zero, which equals C just because you plug it in, that's the critical value. Critical value. Is. And so we, we can define VC, we can evaluate VC at C. And that's exactly how we'll build our map. So we'll define V from C without M to C without the closed disk by sending a parameter C to phi C of C. And this map will turn out to be a control of lots of It's not entirely clear, clear though that is, and that's where a lot of the tech, technical details come again to show. Um, it's not necessarily overly hard. You, it's, it's holomorphic because you can think about it in some ways as the composition of two holomorphic maps. So holomorphic isn't hard to check, but then you have to check bijectivity and all the other things that go along with conformal isomorphism. But this is the map, and that's pretty cool. It somehow 
we were starting in a plane that had no dynamics at all, but because it was parameterizing something that was itself connected, we could somehow build this map, it seemed, using the dynamics handed to us. Um, so we have a conformal isomorphism from C without the mantle brought set to the C without the closed unit disk. Yep. Should be closed. So the question one might ask again, analogous to what we did two days ago, is when can I extend the inverse over an infinity? Well, as I briefly mentioned last time, that's just a question of topology in this map. So psi inverse, sorry, V inverse, map from C without closed unit disk, C without M, extends over the boundary continuously if and only if M is locally connected. And if this were to extend continuously, we could then create a lamination, right? Because if it continues extending, ex uh, if it extends continuously over the boundary, we can think about the rays landing on the circle, and we, we know when we transport them to the Mandelbrot set, they'll land on the Mandelbrot set, so we can create a lamination. Or, so we can think about the Mandelbrot set then as a quotient of the disk by equivalence relations of these rays. But we don't know if it's simply connected. That's actually a conjecture that's still open. Conjecture MLC. M is locally Does MLC stand for M locally connected? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At least I believe that's how I've always interpreted it. Um, in, although we, re so we really kind of want this to be true, but it isn't necessarily entirely clear, I guess maybe that it should be. It's been proven that the rays will land, because this statement is equivalent to all rays landing, and it's proved that rays will land in certain situations, but we haven't been able to show that all rays land, obviously, since this is still open. But also, um, when we prove this theorem, somehow the idea was that the dynamics should mirror, the Mandelbrot set should mirror the dynamics, right? So the Mandelbrot set parameterizes things that are connected, it should be connected. The Mandelbrot set is compact, the Julia sets are also compact. The Julia sets are full, these are also full. So things like this, it seems to mirror the properties of what we're saying. But the issue is, some Julia sets are not locally connected, but some are locally connected. So we don't really know what maybe that dynamic should be telling us to do. So this is a very important open conjecture. Um, that'd be pretty cool to have solved. So we're going to now change our direction briefly. Um, so now that we kind of have some basic properties of the Mandelbrot set, we're going to talk about Hyper, hyperbolic components of the set, which are also pretty cool. So, just a definition. So, a rational map. So we know that critical points will find, if you have a cycle, a critical point must find it, but it's not clear that it should be the case that all critical points have to find cycles. You could have fewer cycles than critical points attracting cycles, in which case, you know, what happens to the other critical points isn't necessarily sure from our previous work. So it turns out these maps are actually very nice. So. Is 
zero. So the Julius will have fluidity measure zero. And then also if J sub F is locally connected. If you only need to connect. So right there, two kind of nice properties of hyperbolic maps. It also turns out that in some sense, hyperbolic maps are stable in some sense. So it, they turn out to be nice. And um, and, in, and in the case we're interested in, in the case of quadratic polynomials, hyperbolic maps are very simple. So notice, we're looking at polynomials of the form z squared plus z, and we're asking when are all the critical points of z squared plus z attracted to an attracting cycle? Well, there's only one critical point of z squared plus z. One critical point. It's one critical point. So, and because we know that an attracting cycle must find a critical point, if E C of Z has one attracting cycle, it is hyperbolic. And vice versa. So hyperbolic can, the hyperbolic condition in the case of quadratic polynomials we're interested in is just saying, do they have one attracting cycle? So we'll let the set M prime be the set of C and M such that PC of Z is hyperbolic. So this is the set where this polynomial has one attracting cycle. There's a unique attracting cycle. Um, instantly from the definition, we know that this is a subset of the Mandelbrot set. It turns out that it is a open subset. And there's another cool conjecture, which is um, m prime is as big as it is equal to the interior of the Mandelbrot set. And this seems to be true. Most of what we look at, I think, when we look at the pictures of the Mandelbrot set are hyperbolic components. Um, so it seems, you know, pictorially, in my mind, it's kind of true. I don't have any idea if other people think it's true or not. But um, it also should be noted, this is a conjecture, but MLC implies this. This is a result of Hubbard and Duity. But if we know that the Mandelbrot is locally connected, then we know its interior is equal to that. And that's kind of a remarkable thing. But So I have a quick question about something you were saying earlier. Yeah. So if MLC were proven, that would mean that um, this other topological thing gives us a parameterization of the boundary of the Mandelbrot set by S1? Yes. OK. So in particular, if this is true, we can make a circle and then a lamination by landing rays, right? So Mandelbrot set looks something like this, maybe. Right? And we can ask where do rays land? And for example, maybe two rays land together here, right? So maybe two rays land, and those are those two. So if we associate those two points together in this lamination, we'll get a topological picture of this. So we can think about it as a quotient of the disk. By, uh, I guess the boundary will be a quotient of the circle, but quotient of the disk for the whole thing. Right? So you just imagine squeezing these together to yeah. pinch off uh, this conjecture. And it also turns out that this set, although we don't understand it entirely, its connected components are kind of amazingly well behaved. It's two particular kind of what I think are awesome theorems that I'll now state without proof. Uh, so M prime is just a set of all things that have an attracting cycle. Um, but it turns out that, I guess I should also say, a connected component of M is called a hyperbolic component.
start of m m prime. So the first theorem. If if m prime meets some component of m, does it have to contain that entire bulb? So like is a, is a hyperbolic component actually going to be a component of the Mandelbrot set? I don't know. I, I think that would imply almost this, wouldn't it? It would say, is if you take a connected component, take the interior. You can write, like, maybe. Well, I guess I was thinking that here maybe the issue is that M prime doesn't even touch some of the components, so there are certain ones that are in it, but... Oh, oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. That's, okay. I don't know, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so if u the subset of m prime is a hyperbolic component, so this is just a connected component of the set of things which have a, a unique attracting cycle, then there are analytic maps. Z zero going from U to the complex numbers through C n minus one. Such that for all C in U P C of Z K. C equals C K plus one of C with the last point wrapping back around so Z when P C of Z n minus one of C is equal to C zero of C. What is N here? Just so can it be arbitrary or is it like like can you find such maps for any set of N or is it like there is some N? There is some n, I should say. So feasibly, I guess there might be a larger n because, like, this is telling us, right, that p, so this is giving us an n cycle of p sub c for any point in here, right? It's giving us an n cycle. Um, you could also think about n cycles, right, as being two n cycles and three n cycles and four n cycles. Um, so it's possible like, you could extend these maps probably in trivial ways to make larger cycles, maybe, right? But not in it. This is true and the set C0 of C, 1 of C, n minus 1 of C is an attracting cycle. So not only is it a cycle, so this, this first condition here just says, okay, I can find functions on my holomorphic component such that this map has an n cycle. I can actually find these maps so it finds me the unique. You're right, there's only one attracting cycle for these maps. We can find it so these maps give us the unique attracting cycle for these. Um, and all, so that means, and sometimes, although I didn't state it, I, this means. Although we didn't start with it necessarily, any connected component of them, any hyperbolic component, will all, all the points in there will have the same size attracting cycle. So we can actually parameterize them. Um, or I guess not parameterize, but for any connected component of the Mandelbrot set, we can now put a number on it. We can say, right, the number of this is the cycle they correspond to, the, attract, the unique attracting cycle that all of these have. And that's kind of cool. I mean, it, and at least to me, it's it's a kind of component of this thing. Which, okay, yes, this has something to do with tracking cycles, but why does it have to be the same size? I don't, I don't necessarily see if that should be true, but that doesn't strike me as something that happens. We'll, I'll, given time in the end, I'll mention. Um, we'll fire up the projector again and look at some examples so we can actually see that this is true. 
the theorem, but it's also, if we can tell even more structure about these, theorem, if n be hyperbolic component, then the map find a cycle and we evaluate the, end, the derivative of the nth iterate of this p sub c at a point in the cycle. So well, if it guess would be p sub c, take the nth iterate of it, take its derivative, and now we have to evaluate it at a cycle, at an n cycle. Well, we saw how to get an n cycle right before we have these functions. So at z0 of c. And it doesn't have to be z0, it could be any of them. We showed that this is independent of the point of the cycle. So this map, this multiplier map, which is map from the hyperbolic component to the unit disk, is a conformal isomorphism. And mu d, sorry, mu, mu u extends continuously and Injectively, not just continuously, but also injectively from the boundary of U to uh, S1. So not only do hyperbolic components have this nice structure where we have every map has a specific cycle attracting a cycle of a specific track, an attracting cycle of a specific size. But also, they're conformally isomorphic to a disk, and also we can extend it, you know, can, you know to the boundary. Somehow, this is these components are really nice. So every time we see one of these components, we're actually can think about them topologically as disks. And moreover, this map gives us kind of two well-defined or natural points to think about in a hyperbolic component. Right? It's a conformal isomorphism, and it extends continuously over the boundary. So any time we pull back a point, we'll get a unique point back, thanks to injectivity. So there are two points that are often of interest. Um, so mu, u inverse of zero, is called the center of u. Multiplier map is actually taking us to the multiplier of the attracting cycle, right? So this is exactly saying, right, that zero should be a, um, or sorry, we should have a super attracting cycle, right? That's what that's telling us. So these are some, I'll not talk about this much right now because we're running a bit short on time, but centers are nice. Uh, and important to these hyperbolic components, and you might ask, well, how do we find these hyperbolic components of size n? Right? I said there are them. I say they are. I said you know, for every hyperbolic component, I can find this uh, period associated to it. But is there a way to actually give it a period, find the balls that correspond these hyperbolic components of that period? Um, and it turns out that we can, namely the center. Right? The center is give me a value of c, it's a point in the Mandelbrot set um, that tells us exactly where the center kind of is, uh, is of our hyperbolic component. And although here we're, we're defining the map from u, right, it really doesn't 
kind of depend necessarily on u somehow. It's just some multiplier condition, right? And the way we can then find these actually is by these count and kind of find the centers is by finding the centers. And so that comes down to a nifty little algebra problem. Uh, the Gleason polynomials. And so we do this by saying q1 of c is just the polynomial c. And then we say qn of c will just be qn minus 1 squared plus c. So we define these polynomials here. We'll call these pre Gleason polynomials. And then we define g n of c, which is the nth Gleason polynomial, to be q n of c, so the nth Gleason pre Gleason polynomial, divided by um, the product of all the Gleason polynomials, which divide. And they're strictly less. So the idea behind this is, well, we know we want uh, to have a cycle here, right? So we want to look at something on the form, right? Like p n of c and z, right? Has to be equal to z. So put differently, p n c of z minus z has to be zero, right? We want to find values of c where this is true, right? The condition that this will be zero actually tells us that um, zero will be the cycle in the cycle. So we can actually evaluate this in zero, and we get those c's, which are the roots of those polynomials. When we think about that as polynomials in c, will be the roots, give us the centers. And if we think about this right, so p1 of c is z is z squared plus c and we evaluate this at zero we get c and here if we take p2 of this right it's just going to be um, here this should say p2 q2 of c is c squared plus c right and here if we take the second iterate we get something here plus c well all this when we evaluate z at zero You'd get a c here the squared plus the c. So we're seeing that these qn's are really just the iterates of pc of z evaluated at z equal to zero, because we know z is in our cycle. Uh -huh. So those these are, but the issue is, and so these will give us parameters of c where c has, where zero has a supertracting cycle of length n. So qn is, will give us those c's. But the issue is, they might not be true periods, right? You can think about a two cycle, as or a four cycle. A two cycle will be fixed by a four cycle, by the fourth polynomial. Just like if you have a fixed point and P fixes a polynomial which has a fixed point, that point will also be kind of look like a, a two cycle because the second iterate will also fix the fixed point. And so will the third iterate, and so will the fourth iterate. So we'll get some um, double counting here, namely. You can show, and it's not hard using dyna the dynamics of it, that if you have a cycle of size dividing n, um, so then these polynomials will divide because they will also be roots here. You're gonna, because you can also think about them as n cycles in this sense. So here what we're doing is we're taking all the possible values of c where our polynomial p, c, and z has a, uh, n cycle at zero, and dividing out by the ones which won't give us a true n cycle. And it turns out that this polynomial is awesome, so in many ways, I think it's pretty cool. So the first thing to note, right, is so this poly the roots of this polynomial will give us our centers. So Gn are one of the centers. Also, this polynomial here is a polynomial we're thinking about it as a polynomial C. This has this is monic and has integer coefficients. This is a monic, you 
you know, this means this will be monic and have integer coefficients, right? That means this polynomial is monic with integer coefficients. So its roots are algebraic integers. So, so this instantly tells us that the roots, if C and CM is a center, then C is an algebraic integer, which is why sh I, I don't know. Like that's just kind of an interesting algebraic fact. And I mean, this also begs the question, right? Conjecture. What do you get? It's not a conjecture because it's a question. What do you, what do you get? Integers, what do we get when we throw them all into Q and form that field extension? I don't know. It might be interesting, it might not, but something algebra is happening now, which is hasn't happened yet for the three days. Um, another conjecture is Gn C is irreducible with. Irreducible in a scalar group is the you know biggest symmetric group it can be. As they said, the conjecture we don't know. Do we know if they're separable? Yeah, we, yes, I think. Okay. I think the next fact will tell you this. So this actually tells us exactly how many uh, hyperbolic components there are. Yes. Yes. Sorry for the pause. I do remember what separable meant. So. This theorem due to Gleason, hence the name Gleason polynomials. And I guess I should be warning people that I don't think the terminology Gleason polynomial is standard, but it's what I was taught, so we'll go with that. Uh, proposition roots. Time, I won't prove this, but it essentially comes down to showing that these roots are simple. And how do we show that? Well, um, you can look at the derivative, we want to look at the discriminant ideal and see whether or not, because that will tell us whether or not they're repeated roots. But um, if we look at this, the, the derivative of this qn is mod 2. They don't vanish because this term goes away, but you have the C which has mod 1, so it won't go away. So you can show some relations with the discriminant that will should exactly tell you this. And it's actually fairly slick if I had more time. I would go through it, it will be in the notes. But this proposition exactly lets us to count them. So the corollary is the number of hyperbolic components. n equals the sum for d dividing n mu d ah, mu d 2 to the d right, where mu is the Mobius function thing and for those who are wondering it starts off 1, 1, 3, 6, 15, 27 and so on And it, there's a bunch of other things you can say, like the roots, there's two types of them. They're either going to be where you have cusps, so like you look at the main ball with Cartier, you get a cusp on the one side, that will be the root of the main ball. Or they'll be where you're attaching. So um, I'll point out, and quickly we'll end with me pointing out some cool things about the Mandelbrot set. It's over time already, sorry.
So, let's see. So, the first thing I'll say is, I didn't talk much about roots, but they're kind of also interesting in their own right. There's two types that I was just saying. One's that occur at cusps here. So this is the root of the main bulb. And ones that occur between bulbs that are connected, so one right here. And that actually means um, you can actually find the equipment to find out where bulbs meet by just finding the roots. So for example, you can show this, figure out what this bulb is, find some polynomial in it, figure out what's going on, calculate its root, its root will be this point, and you can actually figure out what that point is using that, what the root is, is the thing which you one, that's not horribly hard to find out, it turns out this is minus 3 fourths. So that's kind of cool that it lets you do that. Going back to our discussion with, with centers, um, we know that there should be three, so there should be one component. Also, my sum, I think, might have been off by one. So I think the sequence I gave you should be one three. There we go. It's still good, I think. So, um, so we know there should be one, using that theorem, uh, hyperbolic component that has one period one. And good first guess uh, would be the main ball. And we look at, oh, look at, there's a nice fixed point. And it is, in fact, attractive. So the main ball has period. So whatever you're thinking about labeling it, we can put a one in the main ball. Going to this ball, right to the right, we can check it. There's a two cycle. That's the only. Let's see. The next one should have three, so let's see if we can't find three next. Here. There's a three cycle. One thing I want to say is, so here we saw that, this is the last thing I'll say, and I can prove this, and this has almost nothing to do with what we talked about kind of so far, but it's just a super cool fact, I think. This we said is period one, right? And this has period two. And this is the smaller bulb coming off of it, right? So now if we, suppose we zoomed in 